uh, and when you think about the fact that these macro risks are out there and the markets are still going, you could have a very sharp drop in, in, yeah. in the market. And when, if that were to occur, uh, you know, it goes to a, a concept that I think that you were talking about in terms of wrong way risk. Um, talk to me about what that means in terms of pension companies, yeah. how they manage those downturns. So uh, you mentioned the wrong way risk. The wrong way risk is, in other words, uh, if the market goes down, uh, you're going to do worse. So, so I, you know, I, I would describe the risk profile of a pension plan as a, as a nonlinear risk utility. And what I mean by that is mm -hmm. that a loss is way more uh, damaging than a gain is beneficial. So. Uh, you know, if I gained uh, 25%, it's not as beneficial as a 25% loss is damaging. And, and so why that's true is, so if you go back to 2008, some, a lot of funds did have 25% losses. And so today, if we, if we were fully funded, we had 100% uh, of the assets we needed, uh, we need to earn about 6% to keep the thing on an even keel. Mm -hmm. So if we not lose 25%, we now only have 75% of the assets to produce that same level of income, so uh, we need now to need to earn eight on those assets. And plus, because we now, uh, uh, now only have 75% of the assets we had before, we need to earn 33% to get back to where we were. So, you know, it's a bit of a slippery slope. And, you know, we, we, we've done modeling, and, and you can see that there's a certain tipping point you get to that you can't recover from it. So, right. so this, is, this is kind of an implicit assumption in the way pension funds are run, that if you have this long-term uh, uh, time horizon, that, you know, equity market risk can get absorbed and you're, you're going to be fine. Our modeling shows that you can go through these periods where you get to a position where you can't recover from it. Right. So, so I think there's a tipping point, which is probably somewhere between 60 to 70 percent funded, that you, the returns you need to earn to get back to a fully funded status are impossible to actually achieve. So, uh, so there is. So you, what you want to do is make sure that you never get on that slippery slope, and so that's why we've constructed our portfolio. Well, we've constructed it so. You know, we're, we're prepared to give a, we'll give away some of the upside to keep us up from having that downside, and and so it just effectively reduces our volatility and never is going to get us in that position where we're not going to be able to recover from a big downturn. And we're very conscious of that right, all the time. Right. You know, uh, and since we're talking about asset allocation in general, that's where we I started on this. Um, you uh, told me that you actually have a decent amount of real estate uh, in Toronto, also in DC where I'm based. Asset allocation wise, what's the breakdown? You talked about 60-40 when you first came to the business. How would you break that down today in terms of alternative assets like that, real estate, private uh, um, investment and things of that nature? Yeah, so we have uh, about 15% of our assets in real estate. And real estate we consider a matching asset because that has very good inflation hedging characteristics. Mm -hmm. and, um, and plus it produces good income. Uh, we have about 15% in private assets, uh, private equity, uh, private credit. Um, and we have about 15% uh, in public equities. So, uh, and the rest of it is in um, long-term fixed income. Uh, and real return bonds, which is uh, in Canada, we call them, it'd be equivalent to, to tips, and we do own some tips. Um, and uh, so we have inflation hedging asset, which is real estate and, uh, and uh, real return bonds. And then we, and we have, so most of our, uh, should start over. So the, we, have, we actually broken our portfolio down to kind of two components, which is an inflation hedging uh, portfolio and a return seeking portfolio. So the inflation hedging portfolio contains uh, real estate, uh, real return bonds uh, and long-term uh, interest rate bonds, all governments, mm -hmm. uh, and um, um, and we also have a small uh, infrastructure component right now. We just started. Then we then we have uh, uh, so again that portfolio would probably produce in today's world about a three to four percent return. We need to earn six, so we right. need to earn another two hundred basis points from other activities. So we, that's where we have uh, we overlay on top of that exposure to. Equities using equity index future swaps or options. We have uh, exposure to credit using um, um, uh, credit default swaps. So we, we sell credit, uh, credit protection on the investment grade index uh, to get our credit exposure. And then we have um, a whole s uh, suite of uh, absolute return strategies. And so that combination uh, creates our overall asset mix. So it's hard to describe our portfolio in the traditional right, way. Right, right, but, yes. but, but it's. Uh, because it adds up to more than 100. If you right. Know, but but, uh, but that's, uh, that, that's the structure of the portfolio. 
Well, you know, uh, as you were talking, you were talking about inflation, and I was thinking about the uh, drop in uh, market. One of the things uh, that, you know, in terms of the underfunded uh, uh, position of pensions that I found interesting was this concept that in the board managed uh, structure that you have, there's the opportunity to uh, deal with COLA in a way that gives you some catch up. And that's also another, I would call right way risk type of structure. Can you explain how that works? Sure, so our board intends to pay uh, uh, inflation protection on uh, pension payments. So and we, our objective is to try and pay people 100% of CPI every year mm -hmm. as an adjustment on the pension. And we've been able to do that most of the time, but but uh, the board has so it's ad hoc though. In other words, the board will only give you that if if the if we have sufficient funding to do so. If we got into a period where we became underfunded, if we took that from our, our modeling shows, if we took that to from 100% of CPI to zero, that would improve our funded position by about 20%. So that that that's a big lever that yes. that, that really allows you to. Uh, go through a lot of different downturns and manage through risk. And you know, we, again, we model these things most of the time. If that's that's all you would need to do deal with in order to keep our funded funded status sufficient to meet the obligations. So it's a very powerful lever, uh, and uh, uh, you know, uh, and a lot of the funds here have that. Uh, you know, so uh, and and you know, the, the trade-off I would tell members on that one is that uh, you know our, our price is pretty relative is one of the lowest of all the major funds here. So members pay roughly about eight percent of their their compensation or their their salary uh, for, for the plan, mm -hmm. and we can keep it affordable like that because of features like that. So and the, the alternative is we could give you guaranteed call, but we'd have to charge at twelve. <laughs> you know, so if you, you give people that trade-off, they'll say. And so, you know, the, the risk is to you is that in your, when you're retired, there may be periods where we uh, have to lower your inflation protection, uh, uh, and, but when we get sufficient funding, we'll give it back to you. So, uh, and we've done that a couple of times. You know, if we've never taken it to zero, but we've taken it to 75% of right. CPI uh, a couple of times. And once we had sufficient funding, we brought it back to 100 and actually made people hold back to where they would have been. So, so it's uh, uh, it's a very effective tool to to enable us to manage through difficult periods, uh, and and keep the fund going. So again, that that's it surprises people when you find out how effective a tool that actually is. When you mentioned that example, by the way, it reminded me of the advocacy uh, part that you have on the website, which breaks down into those five components. It talks about uh, how much money you could save, how much money you could put in. Uh, if you were to uh, put it into a hoop versus if you did it on your own. And the number that I saw was something like $900,000 uh, extra that you would have to uh, um, save on your own. Yeah. Uh, walk me through that, that math because I think that's pretty extraordinary. Yeah, so what we did is we, we created a uh, theoretical pensioner and it was because mm. we're a healthcare uh, organization, it was a nurse. And so uh, our nurse, Sophia, was, uh, we assumed that, that she started her career at uh, age 25, earning about $40,000 a year and got the usual escalation through her career. And that uh, uh, she retired at age 65 and wanted to uh, replace roughly 7% of her income, which is kind of what, what our plan does. So if you, if you go through what you need to do, and this, you know, so that's where we looked at these five factor savings patterns, um, um, uh, investment acumen, uh, 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 governance alignment, um, management of the uh, of the accumulate accumulation phase, uh, risk sharing, and I'm missing one. Uh, Savings, uh, fees, and fees and costs. costs. Yeah. So, uh, so when you look at all those things, uh, uh, and the two biggest ones are actually say, uh, fees and costs and, and uh, management of, of longevity risk. Uh, th those things uh, uh, result in, uh, uh, if you're an individual, you'd have to put aside about the correct number. I think it's about one point. Uh, Two million dollars mm -hmm. over your career to actually achieve that outcome uh, for that that particular individual, which, by the way, is almost impossible given the, the income level. But but uh, and then uh, uh, but if you did it through hoop, you'd have to put outside about three hundred and twenty thousand dollars. I think is the right number. So it's about a nine hundred thousand dollar difference between what it would cost you to produce exactly the same thing outcome uh, on your own that you would have to that you could produce within a pool plan like hoop. So it's 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 m much more efficient way to actually achieve the same outcome. 
And, and you guys are, I mean, from my perspective, you're totally underselling the differential because, I mean, you say 900,000, but you don't show the actual numbers. 320 versus 1.2 is like a ridiculous uh, transformation. I mean, you're talking about almost four times as much that you would have to put away yeah. in order to replicate that on your own. Yeah, and, and you know, the reality is most people just don't have that kind of money to do that. So, right. I mean, it's not even matter whether you, if you wanted to, you probably don't have sufficient funds to actually do that. So it's, uh, uh, but but that's that's the equivalent number. 